Hey, it's Mr. Anderson, and today I'm going to review all of the levels within Unit 1. So this is basically on natural selection. Um, before we talk about natural selection, we should define the following term, and that is evolution. And so when you start biology, you should start with evolution. Uh, people are confused sometimes as far as what evolution is. If we were to define evolution at its most basic term, it simply changes in the gene pool or changes in the allele frequency within the gene pool. And so what's the smallest unit in biology that can evolve? That would be the population. In other words, individuals are going to survive or not. And based on those that survive or not, uh, our population is going to change over time. So we call that evolution. Now, the one of the mechanisms by which evolution can occur is something called natural selection. And so what is natural selection? Uh, the definition I'd like you to remember is differential reproduction success. In other words, organisms are going to live or die, and based on those that are able to live and pass their genes on, then we form a new population. And so a term that I just threw around is something called fitness. If you're able to survive and pass on offspring, then you're fit, at least in the biological perspective. And so let me change colors here for just a second. Okay, so the most, the quintessential example of this is the um, peppered moths of Europe. And so basically they come in two different types. They have the recessive type, which is homozygous recessive. It's going to be this light coloration. And then uh, the dark coloration is either going to be homozygous uh, dominant or heterozygous dominant. So these are your two different types that you could have. And these, uh, this is a picture of them on a tree. And you can see right here that the white one is going to fit in much better than the dark one. And that's the way it used to be in Europe. Something like 98% of the individuals were of the light type. But during the Industrial Revolution, when we were using a lot of coal to generate energy, um, it, it got really, really dark. And so the bark started to get darker and darker and darker. So the birds were able to target those that were light in color. And so we saw a shift from the light coloration to the dark coloration. And so it's not like the individuals were changing. It's since the birds were eating more of the white ones, then that population was going to drop and we saw an increase in the dark ones. And so now the population had changed. And so there's a lot of things that can cause evolution. So you could have a small sample size, for example, or you could have mutations. But natural selection is the only of those mechanisms that's actually going to lead to populations that are better adapted for their local environment. Okay, so next, let's talk about the population genetics lab. Remember in the population genetics lab, we took a cup, we put 50 beads of different color in it, we shake it out, we pull out 40 pair, and that sets the allele frequencies for our next generation. And so if you look at the three different types that we did, so this would be Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we found that the allele frequency stayed essentially the same through all of those generations. And the reason why, the reason it stayed the same, is that we didn't violate any of those five constraints of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. In other words, we had a large population size, there was random mating, there was no mutations, there's no gene flow, and there's no natural selection, and so it stayed the same that whole time. But when we started started to do selection, in other words, when we, in the selection uh, part of the population genetics lab, uh, what we were doing, remember, is we'd pull out 40 pair, and then we'd kill all those that were homozygous recessive. And so now we were selecting those. You could think of them having a recessive disorder, and they die from that. Well, what we established now was a new Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and so it kind of leveled out. Now, it was really hard to eventually get rid of those recessive traits because you had to have two of them to get rid of it. And so it kind of leveled out around something like 9% of the allele frequency. Um, that's the selection. And then finally, we did heterozygote advantage. So in heterozygote advantage, remember, we were killing all of those that are homozygous recessive. Um, that'd be an example would be sickle cell anemia. If you have homozygous recessive, you're going to die as a result of the disease. But we also removed a third of those that were homozygous dominant because they didn't have the sickle cell heterozygous gene, so they would have been targeted by malaria. And so we established a, a similar kind of an equilibrium at this point. Um, and so again, what's the goal of population genetics lab? It's just showing how the positive uh, or the dominant allele, that's P, and the recessive allele uh, will eventually stabilize as long as you can keep all five of those the same. But if it varies, then what's occurring? Evolution. So we're getting change in the allele frequency in the gene pool, and so evolution has occurred.
Okay, um, next thing we talked about was examples of natural selection. Uh, two examples I gave you. Number one was the, the change in the flowering, the time of flowering. And so with global warming, we're starting to have spring come much sooner. And so if you were to flower all the way out here as a plant in let's say July or, or let's say August, um, well, you're going to die as a result of that uh, because there's a lot of other plants that are flowering much, flowering much earlier. And so what we've seen with increase in temperature, if we look at time down here, and then this is when they flower, the number that are flowering, is that we're seeing a push in this direction. So we're called that directional selection because flowers that are now able to flower in late May are surviving, and so they're outcompeting those that flower later in the year. And so when you see a bell-shaped curve like this move direction, um, the ten tendency is to think that plants are making this choice. And remember, that's not true at all. What's happening is that those that choose here are dying. And so that's pushing the bell-shaped curve over here. Just like before, if you used to flower earlier, then you would die as a result of that. And so now let's say the temperature starts to get colder and colder and colder. We would expect to see directional selection moving it in the other direction. Another example of natural selection I've talked about is the sickle cell gene. Sickle cell um, anemia creates, it's a hemophilia, uh, excuse me, a, a, a mutation in the uh, hemoglobin protein that's found inside the blood. Um, but basically what it does is if you're heterozygous for the trait, it allows you to survive a malarial infection. And so this graph right here shows you where malaria is found. And this shows you the allele frequency uh, of this sickle cell disease in people that live there. And so you can see that those that had that allele were able to survive. And so we've seen natural selection or we've seen an increase in that allele frequency in that population because it offers them protection against malaria. Next thing we talked about is genetic drift. Genetic drift, remember, is going to be another thing that can actually cause evolution. Genetic drift, when you see that word, what I want you to think about is um, chance. So genetic drift is when we decrease the population size. And so this is a cool simulation. This is a computer simulation over here where we have 2,000 in this one. And then we've just got regular Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And you see what happens is the allele frequencies tend to stay right around 0.5. But once we decrease the number down to 200 or even 20, what happens is chance takes over. And so these start to move in odd directions or they like to drift away from that equilibrium. And what's causing that is simply just chance. And so once we decrease the size of our population, chance can take over. So if you look over here, let's say this is our original population. It's got an allele frequency of 0.5 for both. But let's say I just grab a handful of those randomly. What I'm going to now have is allele frequencies that are much different than that original population. And so you can get a founder population that's nothing like that original population. And that's just due to chance. Remember, two specific examples of that would be the bottleneck effect, where you have a large population that gets squeezed through a bottleneck. And even though it may make a comeback, it's going to have less genetic diversity. Uh, another one would be a founding population. Population. So why is it that we only find finches on the Galapagos? It's because those are the birds that were originally blown there. And then they, uh, radi uh, they adaptively radiated to the climates on each of the different uh, islands. Example of this would be the northern elephant seal. Remember that we're almost hunted to extinction, something like 20 left on the planet. Um, and so they were able to make a comeback, but they had lost a lot of that genetic diversity that they had before. Uh, evidence for evolution. Evidence for evolution abounds in biology. Uh, uh, you, you look no further than antibiotic resistance, for example. As we take more and more antibiotics, bacteria are simply becoming resistant to those antibiotics. Uh, find the same thing in HIV, that as we develop new drugs, they can quickly mutate and adapt to that. Um, there's other pieces of evidence that we have that shows that evolution and natural selection are occurring. Uh, this would be different bone structures in different animals. And so if you look at our arm and that of a whale, you'll find that they have the same exact bone structure. And so that indicates that these are homologous. Homologous means they come from the same origins. Um, in other words, you could probably build a whale flipper in a different way, but if you're set with an ancestor with this bone structure, that's how you're going to make the flipper. Another example would be biogeography. So these are all the different uh, Galapagos tortoises that we'd find in the Galapagos. Some are adapted to 
uh, areas where there's not much food, so they have a longer neck and this kind of a saddle-shaped uh, shell. Um, it's not that they somehow reached out their neck and grabbed higher fruit, and that's how they got the long neck. It's just that those that had a real short neck uh, weren't able to survive on an island like this. Whereas if you were on an island like Santa Cruz, where there's food everywhere, to have a long neck would have made you more susceptible to any kind of a predator when you're growing up. And so where organisms are also gives us evidence to evolution. But the, the trump card would be DNA uh, and RNA. It's going to be the genetic material that we have. So this is data from, in class we did that viral infection where I sent this one code. So that's the RNA of that original code and then you passed it from person to person with uh, occasional mutations. And so there's 37 people in the class that have been infected by that. But we see all these varying strains. And so if you think of all life on our planet, all life on our planet came from that, that first organism that had this genetic material, this DNA. It's been mutated. It's adapted to its, climate, its uh, local climates over time. But we can look at the DNA, for example, of these tortoises, and we can find how similar it is. And we could also compare that to the DNA of the tortoise in Ecuador that probably floated to the Galapagos Islands so we can make these relationships. And so if Darwin would have had genetic material available, and the, and the type that we have today, there wouldn't have been debate about whether natural selection or evolution are real. Uh, next thing we did was the camouflage lab. Remember in the camouflage lab, there were two parts to that. You developed an experiment where you were uh, placing chads on fabric, and then we were selecting those and determining the allele frequencies over time. And so we found that those that blended in, their allele frequencies went up, and those that stood out, their allele frequencies went down. We also did the, trait, the great chad capture, remember, where the chads were spread around the room, and if they showed up, then you targeted those. These would be the dark colors that you targeted, and then the green and the white fit in with the floor. And so if we were to keep playing the great chad capture over and over and over, we would see natural selection. Eventually, you'd have so many of the white and the green that maybe the other ones would uh, have a chance, or maybe they would go extinct. So that's the camouflage lab. And then the last thing that I wanted to talk about in this first unit is the idea that all life shares common ancestry. And so there are certain things that are conserved. In other words, all organisms use DNA for their genetic material. All organisms take that DNA, make messenger RNA, make proteins, and make the organism itself. So this whole central dogma is another thing that's conserved in life. And then we also conserve, like ATP, the machinery that we use to harness energy and release it from our food or in, uh, in photosynthesis. Um, that's going to be the same in all living things. And so since all of these share the same things, it makes sense that they share a common ancestry. And we also find, you know, glycolysis, parts of the uh, respiration are conserved throughout all, all of life. And so that indicates that they are used by this last universal common ancestor. And so that's just a beginning to natural selection, and I hope that's helpful.